The Prime Minister says the coronavirus is likely to spread in the UK. When COVID-19 hit the UK, the seriousness of the situation, it seemed a uniquely terrible event. Which you can recover. For others, it can be deadly. But it wasn't the first time we'd suffered a deadly epidemic. In a frightening parallel 350 years earlier, we endured one of the greatest tragedies in British history, the Great Plague. Over 18 months, beginning in 1665, this horrific disease killed an estimated 100,000 people in London alone, a quarter of the entire population, and a further 100,000 as it spread across the country. Over three programmes, we're telling the horrifying story of how the catastrophe unfolded day by day, week by week. We filmed this series as COVID-19 began its spread across the world. And for me, the connections between the two pandemics are remarkable. It's a frightening lesson from history. I'm Zand Van Tulliken, and in this first programme, I track the early days of the Great Plague epidemic and trace it back to its source. It all kicked off right here. John Sargent discovers the terrible symptoms of the plague and investigates its transmission. This is the cause of the whole thing we can see in this bedroom. This is the centre of it all. And Raksha Dave uncovers extraordinary new evidence which reveals how the disease really spread. So you think that these have been spreading the plague? Just one is enough to be sick and even to die. This is the story of the Great Plague. Twenty-first century London is a world away from the city of the 1600s. But in secret corners of the modern city, we can still find traces of what happened here in 1665, the deadliest epidemic in Britain's history, the Great Plague. With my knowledge as a doctor of modern infectious disease, I'll be investigating how the plague devastated first London and then large parts of the country. The first thing I need to figure out, as with any disease outbreak, is how and where it started. And this book, A Journal of the Plague Year, by Daniel Defoe, the famous author of Robinson Crusoe, has some important information for me. Defoe was just a child at the time of the Great Plague, but his book is believed to be based on the account of his uncle. He tells us that two men, said to be Frenchmen, died of the plague in Longacre, or rather at the upper end of Drury Lane. Well, Longacre runs down there. This is the upper end of Drury Lane. It all kicked off right here. It's believed the Frenchmen were weavers who imported the plague into London in an infected shipment of cotton. The first two deaths were in December 1664, but then there were no more until four months later, in April 1665, when two more people died. All four of those early deaths occurred here, in an area around Drury Lane called St Giles in the Fields. It seemed like an outbreak was brewing. Today, this is the heart of London's theatre and nightlife. But 350 years ago, it was a new suburb, recently sprung up outside the official city of London. In the 50 years before the Great Plague, countryside around London had been swallowed up as the population doubled from 200 to 400,000 people. Like many of the suburbs that sprung up outside the ancient city walls, St Giles was one of the poorest areas of London. Here, slightly better off people would have lived on one of the main wider streets, but off those streets were narrow alleys like this one. They were crammed with illegally built slum housing. And in late April 1665, it was in these back alleys where cases of plague began to multiply. Families of up to 10 people were crammed into two-room houses. They worked as weavers, labourers, servants and porters. 
Diseases like smallpox, tuberculosis, and typhus were common. Even plague wasn't unfamiliar. In the previous 300 years, there had been 18 major outbreaks in London. But this one would surpass them all. In the first week of May, the plague spread to several streets around St Giles in the fields. And there were nine more deaths. The rising death toll confirmed to Londoners that a plague epidemic had begun and it struck terror into their hearts. Older residents would have seen friends and family suffer with this disease before and they knew what to expect. John Sargent is discovering why the symptoms of this disease held such dread. I'm meeting specialist Dr. Chris Conlon at the Weald and Downland Museum, where many houses dating to the time of the Great Plague have been preserved. Why was the plague so frightening? Well, it was a terrible disease for people, and it had a very high death rate, so it caused huge devastation and terror. There was a bubonic type, which is to do with lymph nodes, a septicemic type, which when it gets into your bloodstream, and a pneumonic type that affects your lungs, and they're all pretty terrible. In fact, it does still exist today. So what, across the world? Yeah, for example, the big outbreak a couple of years ago in Madagascar, been outbreaks in China, and even get in the southwest USA. In 1665, it was predominantly bubonic plague that swept through London. It was a bacterial infection, unlike COVID-19, which is caused by a virus. Plague was incredibly infectious and killed about 70% of those who caught it. With the help of prosthetic makeup artist Florence Carter, Dr. Conlon is going to show me what a victim of this type of plague would have endured. If I did have the plague, Doctor, what would I feel like? You'd be a bit pale. Right. And starting to be a bit sweaty. At the same time, you'd be getting a headache. In addition to that, you'd be developing aches and pains in your muscles and joints, and you might even shiver. And then as the disease progresses, you're going to get a very high fever, maybe up to 40 degrees. You might even get confused or delirious. And then you probably start noticing some pain in your neck where your lymph node is starting to enlarge. Right, so here. And how quickly would that really develop. That could come up over a few hours to a day or so. So this is a terrifying moment, isn't it? This yeah. is the first real signs of the plague. That's right. It's the, it's the bubo of the bubonic the bubo. plague. Yeah, oh God. And you would feel that if you had to turn your head to the right, it would be too painful to do. Yeah. So your head would be sort of tilted to one side to avoid the pain. I'm aware of the fact that just the loneliness of it would be so striking. Be it would be terrifying, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? it yeah. would be you're going to die, and by the way, we can't do anything for you, and just stay there and yeah. think about nothing yeah. else. Yeah. And would the pain be growing all the time? Yes, because it's getting larger all the time. Yeah. And you might actually get a, a rash as the bacteria spreads into the skin a bit. And these bacteria are multiplying rapidly, but more importantly, this bacteria is now in your bloodstream. When it gets into the bloodstream, it's bad news, and most people in those days wouldn't survive. So what's happening here is that your nose circulation has been affected and the tip of your nose no longer has any blood supply. So the skin and the tissue underneath is dying and becoming gangrenous and will turn blue and then black. Once people know that this is spreading, it just you can see why people just panic and go sort of mad. Yes, that's right. And, and, and to see these symptoms appearing, these big lumps in people's necks and groins and the rash and the, the gangrene are pretty horrifying sights. So from the time that I fell ill to now, how long has it been? This is probably three or four days after you first started feeling a bit hot and sweaty and achy, and probably five or six days after you first got infected. This is a very rapidly progressive illness. It's time, I suppose, for the inevitable question. At this stage, Doc, how long have I got? You'll be dead within 24 hours, if not sooner. This is, this is the really end stage of this terrible disease. Is there any hope at all? No hope at this stage at all. By early May 1665, 13 people had died of plague, and thousands more were now at risk from this incurable disease. And fear was stalking the streets of London. 
By May 1665, the plague had taken hold in London, and in the cramped back alleys of the capital, it was spreading rapidly. In the four months since the first reported case, 13 people had died, and many more were now infected. Londoners feared this was only the beginning. In a terrible foreshadowing of the events of 2020, they had watched with growing concern as the epidemic headed towards Britain. An eruption of plague in Turkey in 1661 had spread to the great ports of Holland, where in 1663, tens of thousands had died. To stop it crossing the channel, a blockade was set up at Tilbury Fort, 20 miles downstream from the city. Any ship that arrived without a certificate of health was held in quarantine for 30 days. Not just that, but in fact, two Navy ships were set to patrol the Thames all the way up to London Bridge here. And for a year, those measures worked. But then, as we know, the plague breached those defences and made its way into London. The deadly plague bacteria produced symptoms in around three days and killed more than half of those who contracted it. Back then, they didn't know about bacteria. They only knew this disease by its horrific effects. Now, of course, we know rather more, and Raksha is going to meet this most deadly of diseases face to face. Understandably, there aren't many places in Britain today where you can find Yersinia pestis, the bacteria that causes bubonic plague. Morning. But I've managed to get special access to the top secret Ministry of Defence research facility at Porton Down, where countermeasures against chemical and biological weapons are developed. They're working with plague in one of their high-level containment labs, I'm not allowed inside, so have to watch through the door with research scientist Diane. So Chris has taken the, the sealed box containing the plates, the agar plates with uh, cultured plague on them. Oh and gosh, so that's actually plague in the box. I've excavated lots and lots of plague victims, and this is the first time I've seen it up close. Quite glad that this door's here. Yes, it's a very natural reaction. Plague is very, very dangerous, and that's why we handle it in, in this containment level three lab and safety cabinet. So how much of that bacteria would I have to ingest to become infectious? We're talking about 10 to 100 organisms, a tiny amount, uh, which will cause a rapid infection. It's quite unbelievable, isn't it? Because it's a very, very tiny amount yes. could just set off this huge chain reaction. That's true. And thousands of people can be affected within days. Of course, that's why plague has been such a successful pathogen to infect people. Plague evolved about 10,000 years ago in Asia. Unlike coronavirus, it spread no further for millennia. It first reached Europe along trade routes in 541 AD, as the Roman Empire declined. This was the first of three great pandemics. The first pandemic lasted 200 years, with repeated outbreaks killing up to 50 million people. A second pandemic swept to Europe 700 years later in the 14th century. Known as the Black Death, there were two centuries of outbreaks, including the Great Plague that we're looking at. The third plague pandemic engulfed the world at the end of the 19th century. Only then did scientists finally figure out what they thought was spreading the disease. In 1894, Yersin, the founder of the now Institute Pasteur in, in Paris, identified the bacterium and identified that plague was transmitted by rats and rat fleas to humans. Yersin, of course, gave his name to the bacterium, Yersinia pestis, and did a lot of early work on the epidemiology of plague. Yersin's research in Asia revealed rats infected with plague passed it on to their fleas. When the rats died of the disease, the fleas were forced to feed on people, passing it on to them. <laughs> 
And then it's assumed from that pandemic that that's the way that it was transmitted in earlier pandemics. Yes. The knowledge that arose from that discovery was then retrospectively fitted to the, the second and the first pandemics, yes. So, for the last hundred years, rats and their fleas have been blamed for spreading the Great Plague through London in the spring of 1665. In the week to the 15th of May, there were three more deaths. A small increase, but significantly, the disease was now spreading beyond the parish of St. Giles in the Fields, and the first case was reported within London city walls. The first death in the square mile within the ancient city walls of London occurred here on Mansion House Place, which back then was called Bearbinder Lane. And again, the author Daniel Defoe blamed the French, saying the man who died here was a Frenchman who had selfishly fled the outbreak in the suburb of St Giles. Plague wasn't just in the slums anymore. Bearbinder Lane was just around the corner from this the Royal Exchange, the financial heart of the city. It's where London's elite came to do business, and they were now horrified that the plague threatened them. We know people are getting worried because they tell us so. Famous diarist Samuel Pepys describes going to a coffee house where everybody is talking about the plague. Another eyewitness, a priest called Thomas Vincent, tells us that by now everyone is really frightened. Thomas Vincent was a Puritan minister who lived in Spitalfields with a group of his congregation. He believed the plague was a punishment from God inflicted on Londoners because of their promiscuous behaviour. Samuel Pepys lived in rather more comfortable surroundings with his wife and servants, just north of the Tower of London. He didn't blame plague on the Almighty, but instead wrote, only God could save them from the disease. Both men knew from experience, the rising death toll indicated a terrible epidemic was coming. In the last week of May, the number of plague deaths reported increased to 17. Most victims were still in St. Giles, in the alleys near Drury Lane. Despite the growing fear, normal life in the area continued. Alehouses, coffee houses and theatres were still packed with customers. This is the famous Theatre Royal Drury Lane. It's the oldest theatre in London, and at the moment it's undergoing a massive refurbishment. But the original theatre was built on this site two years before the outbreak. It was established by King Charles II himself, hence the royal in the name. The theatre was located just a stone's throw from the epicentre of the epidemic. Despite that, each night, 700 people crammed into a building only 34 metres long and 18 metres wide. But it gradually became clear that normal public life couldn't continue. It was at this point in June 1665 that the rising death toll finally forced King Charles to close the theatres. To find out how people were reacting to the rapidly escalating epidemic, I'm meeting historian Vanessa Harding. We're here in St Giles in the Fields, and it's this parish where the plague began in 1665. How are people in London feeling at this stage? I think they're starting to get really quite worried. The number of deaths by the end of May is as many as the last six or seven years put together. And people do have a lot of experience of plague in London, and they know that if deaths start to rise in the late spring, early summer, and don't go down again, then there's a good chance they're in for a bad epidemic. Why does it begin here, at the, the time this is a western suburb of London? We don't know why it starts here. But one of the things that's really interesting is that this is about as far as you can get from the port areas of London. 
So if plague is being imported from abroad on fleas, on rats, on ships, if that were true, then you would expect it to start down by the waterside or in the East End. This is almost the last place you'd expect it to begin. OK, so that's quite mysterious. This is one of many inconsistencies that have led historians and scientists to question the assumption that the Great Plague was only spread by rats and their fleas. What have you learned from looking at parish records about how the plague was spreading in this part of London? We have a lot of records surviving from this time. And one of the things that comes through from that is that it often seems to cluster in households and it's not spreading in a sort of even geographical ripple. It doesn't infect every house in one street. Some families are infected, but by no means all. So that, that to me, would suggest it's spreading person to person rather than having rats, which you'd expect would move it all the way along a street. Yes, yes, it certainly looks like that. So you've got these inconsistencies with the geographic location, with the way it's spreading. Are we sure this is bubonic plague? We do know that now. Um, there have been quite a lot of excavations of buried bodies of human remains from plague sites over the last few years. And analysis of the ancient DNA shows that Yersinia pestis was present. So we know it's plague, but the inconsistencies remain. Yes, and I think that means we have to look again at what we think we know about Yersinia pestis and it's being spread by rats and rat fleas and think about whether there might be other ways in which it's being spread. So what you're suggesting is that we have to rethink everything we know about bubonic plague and how it spreads. Yeah. Wow. In the first week of June, 1665, 43 people died of plague in London more than double the previous week's total. This rate of increase confirmed that the epidemic was accelerating. For a hundred years, it's been believed that only rats and rat fleas were spreading the disease. But there's now new evidence suggesting plague was actually transmitted in a different way. In Marseille, on France's Mediterranean coast, scientists have been investigating a new theory. A terrible plague epidemic struck here in 1720, 55 years after London's Great Plague. 100,000 people were killed. It was Europe's last ever epidemic of the disease, and since then, Marseille University has been at the cutting edge of research into its causes. Recently, they've made some astonishing discoveries. The work here was overseen by Professor Drancourt. He's taking me to see the animals he has identified as plague transmitters. Oh, here we go. And they're not rats. Right. They're bred in a secure room in the university's basement. If you can just open the incubator and show us wow. the bugs. Terrible bugs. So these are body lice. Oh. So you, you can have a closer look. As you can see, uh, they have maintained on a piece of clothes. Is that where they are more comfortable than latching onto cloth? Yes, they are called body lice, but it is a rather misleading word, body. They do live in the clothes on close contact to the skin in order to be able to get the daily blood meal. Body lice are similar to head lice, but these bloodsuckers have adapted to live on clothes rather than in hair. While head lice are still widespread in Europe today, modern laundry methods have almost eradicated body lice. So you think that these little bugs have been spreading the plague? Yes, we do think that they did play a crucial role in, in plague uh, epidemics. And how did you figure that out? So we injected plague in a rabbit and then we put the lice on the skin of the rabbit, you know, 
and these guys were able to get the plug from one infected rabbit and transmit to another one and transmit to another one, in fact. And so definitively, lice is competent to transmit the plug. So how long does it take for the rabbits that didn't have the plague to then be infected by the plague? Tw 24 hours, <gasps> that's enough. 24 hours? Yes, 24 hours. And just one is enough to be sick and even to, to die. Wow. And there's another human parasite bred here that's also been proved can spread bubonic plague directly without any rats involved. Some people may carry fleas also. The human fleas may transmit the plague from one sick people to another one. So it is an other example of a human ectoparasite fueling the plague in a community. So fleas can spread plague without rats being involved at all? Exactly. If you just get the rat and the rat fleas, you cannot really understand how plague move from one guy to another one and, and so on in order to get a thousand of, of uh, dead a week in London, for example. It is necessary to put a body lice plus the human freeze in the scenario to, to understand what really happened. When I was first taught about the plague at school, I was told that it was incontrovertible scientific fact that it was rats and its fleas that were spreading the plague. But what I've just learned has just turned all of that on its head. This groundbreaking research from Marseille allows us to look at the Great Plague in a completely new light. The way the disease spread, the stories eyewitnesses told and the preventive measures taken in the 17th century could all make a lot more sense if we put less emphasis on the rat and look more closely at human fleas and lice. With this in mind, I've come to the archives of the London Guildhall. Records here allow us to track the plague spread through the capital. So this is the Bills of Mortality for London from 1665. And I used to have the job basically compiling a book like this. I was a surveillance, epidemic surveillance officer for the World Health Organization. And I was doing what they're doing here, which is recording the number of deaths from particular illnesses from every parish in London. So I've got here the 20th of June, 1665. What's so striking is St Giles in the Fields, that very poor parish where plague began, has got 143 deaths from plague this week. But what's even more disturbing is that the plague has spread. So if I look at neighbouring Hoburn, 37 deaths, 15 are from plague. Oldgate, four deaths, three are from plague. If we look in Westminster, we've got 38 deaths, but 26 of them are from plague. All of these are poor neighbourhoods, they're outside the city walls. But if I look at the parishes that are within the city walls, the more affluent areas, what's very striking is that there's almost no deaths from plague in those wealthier neighbourhoods. We can see St Olaf, Hart Street, no deaths. And that is where our friend, the diarist Samuel Pepys lived. It was in this month, June 1665, that Samuel Pepys had his first brush with plague. He was taking a carriage into the city when the driver was suddenly taken ill. And Pepys wrote that he suddenly was unable to stand, he collapsed, he was taken blind, and Pepys was understandably absolutely terrified that he had had this encounter with a probable plague victim. I don't think London's wolves were somehow physically holding back the infection from inner-city parishes like Pepys's. The fact is that the older, more established parishes inside the city walls were much more affluent, and the disease was spreading in the illegally built slums and the back alleys that had recently sprung up outside the city walls. This was noticed at the time. It was even called the Paws Plague. Now, the crucial difference for me between the living conditions of the rich on that side of the wall and the poor on this side of the wall was the number of fleas and lice they were infested with. 
Why did the living conditions of London's poor make them so vulnerable? John Sargent has gone to find out. I'm visiting a reconstructed 17th century house with historian Professor Catherine Richardson. This is something like the poor, a poor family would have inhabited yeah. in early modern London. So we've got one room downstairs for yeah. the whole family and one room upstairs. So it's small if you've got a big family. That's right, yes. Yeah. We've got perhaps six, seven, eight, nine people uh, all living all in this space. Yep. Yeah. So what made these poorer homes more likely to add to the spread of the plague then? So the most important things we need to look at are upstairs. Right. So here we are. Now, if we're looking for a breeding ground for lice and fleas in this house, I think this is where we need to be looking. Right, so why more for the poor than for the rich in the same circumstances? This is one of the rooms where you can see most clearly the difference between the social groups. So if you imagine a rich bedroom, uh, it's much bigger than this. Um, it's got a four-poster bed with curtains around it to keep them warm. Clean it's got linen. feather beds. It's got no end of linen. It's got linen that's worth more than this house. Here, we've got a mattress of sorts, but it's straw. So the fleas like the straw, don't they? Yeah. These sheets, they'll be infested with lice. And of course, if they have got sheets, mm -hmm. one, perhaps maximum two sheets. So we're not going to be washing them very often. And then here we've got perhaps all the children sleeping together. It's companionable and it's warm. But of course, from our point of view, thinking about, about insects, uh, that's a marvellous environment for them to be growing. So yeah, you, you take off your outer garments when you've finished work um, and you might put them on top of the bed to keep you even warmer, but you're likely to leave on uh, your inner garments, your, your, uh, your linens. This is the breeding ground for the fleas and the lice, which means the plague spreads. I mean, this is, this is the cause of the whole thing we can see in this bedroom. If you like, this is the centre of it all. These conditions fuel the plague's relentless advance, and families across London watched in fear as the disease approached their neighbourhoods. By mid-June 1665, the plague was accelerating through London, and 168 people a week were now dying. We've established body lice and human fleas can transmit the bubonic plague, and we know many 17th century Londoners were infested. But I'm looking for a clinching piece of evidence to confirm they spread the Great Plague, not rats. To do this, I've come to the location of a much more recent plague outbreak. In 1900, there was an outbreak of bubonic plague here in the Gorbals district of Glasgow. It was part of the third plague pandemic, which had started in Asia and spread around the world in the 1880s. This much more recent outbreak was much better documented and it gives us incredible insights into how the disease spread. Now, amazingly, living conditions in tenements like these behind me in Glasgow in 1900 were not very different to 17th century London slums. This means investigating the 1900 outbreak in Glasgow slums will allow us to see if the lice and flea theory stacks up. It was a family who lived in one of these tenements, the Bogies, who fell sick first. To discover what happened, I'm meeting historian Dr. Clifford Williamson at a reconstructed tenement flat. So th this is the kind of room that the plague started in in Glasgow? Uh, absolutely, this is your typical glass region tenement kitchen, living room, apartment. So you could have a family of, you know, 10 living in one or two rooms this size? Absolutely, and it would be incredibly commonplace. Now, talk to me about the Bogie family. Who were they? They live on the bottom rung of the ladder. 
The father is a docker. The granny sells fish outside pubs at closing time uh, just to make ends meet. So who, who falls ill first? It's the grandmother that falls ill first and the grandchild. And it just appears to be another infectious disease, which is something which they will see constantly throughout their lives. So, so uh, the grandmother and the granddaughter die. Talk me through what's happening in the wake. You've got people visiting. Where are the bodies? The body is right in the centre of the room because that's, that's the, the focus of attention and hundreds of people are coming through the doors like it's a football turnstile. At the time, there were reports that they were kissing the face of the corpses. Apparently, that's part of the ritual of the wake. If you've got a body laid out on this table that's just died of plague, and lice leaving that body, that is a catastrophe. Oh, it is a, it is a disaster waiting to happen. So people disperse from the wake. Yep. What happens then? Well, the, the, the infection becomes mobile. It's now got carriers who will then start to create little hot spots of infection all of their very own. Families across Glasgow began to fall sick with plague. To find details of how the disease was spreading, I've come to look at documents held by the NHS Glasgow archives. So this is what I've really come here for. This is the report on certain cases of plague occurring in Glasgow in 1900. It's absolutely extraordinary document. There's a page of photos of plague victims. We have armpit buboes, necrosis involving the skin. A young boy, probably about my son's age, and the picture is to show his facial expression, the kind of exhausted, worn out, drained look on his face you get a sense of how much fear this disease causes. There's an extraordinary section here which catalogues all the cases that were recognized as plague. So we start with Mrs. B, patient zero. That's Mrs. Bogey, age 57. She lives at 71 Rose Street. She's a fish hawker. But this column here is figuring out how they caught the disease in the first place. This feels like a very modern thing to do. So even now we would do contact tracing. So first of all, we have the husband of the first patient, so that's Mr. Bogey. But then we have someone who's a relative and helped to nurse the first patient, a neighbor, then people who attended the wakes, people who attended the funeral service. 52 Dale Street, we have a man who dies, and when he dies, his bed is gifted to a neighbor. And a week later, the man who got the bed gets sick from plague and he ends up dying. Now that's someone who's got plague without any direct contact with someone who has plague. So the bed is the vehicle for the plague. The picture that is built up through this document is that every person affected, they were able to trace back to some contact with an infected person or with an infected item. But the most interesting line to me in the report is the final paragraph and they say, in Glasgow, whatever the source of the original infection may have been, there was no evidence that rats played any part carrying it amongst those who were attacked by the disease. And in fact, they rounded up 236 rats caught within the plague area and could not find any evidence of infection in the rats. That, to me, is feeling pretty conclusive. This is a picture of the plague team, the doctors and nurses who were looking after their patients. They all would have known how dangerous the illness was. So they're doing something that's extremely courageous. 36 people in Glasgow contracted plague. 16 of them tragically died. They were living in squalid, overcrowded houses just like the slums of 17th century London, infested with lice and human fleas. Which convinces me it was primarily human parasites that had so rapidly spread the bubonic plague to 20 London parishes by the 26th of June, 1665. The weekly death rate had jumped to 267 and was almost doubling every week.
There was no local government in the 17th century, so it was officials from the parish churches who had to try and deal with this spiraling epidemic. One of the few buildings that has miraculously survived from the time of the Great Plague is St. Bartholomew the Great, London's oldest parish church. Now, like all of London's parish churches, Great St. Bart's played an important role in the response to the plague. Parish officers organised money and food relief for the poor. They also recorded all plague deaths in their area. And they had to bury the ever-increasing numbers of dead. Each of those deaths was marked by a tolling of the church bell. The actual bell that rang out here during the Great Plague survives. It dates to the early 1500s, and it still works. I mean, this is amazing. So, this is the great bell that's going to ring, but before it does, I'm just going to get in my ear defenders because I think it's going to be pretty loud. Tower captain Paul Norman still rings the bell today just as his predecessors did 350 years ago. You can imagine it ringing out all over London. For me, it's pretty magical, I have to say, but that sound ringing out during the Great Plague, I think it would have felt very different hearing it then. The infamous death knells rang out from every London church to mark each death in their parish. As the epidemic intensified in early July, the bells in the worst hit parishes were tolling over 20 times a day. Death knells like that from parish churches would have been heard all across London. There was no traffic noise to drown them out. And as they began to ring with more and more frequency, it would have been a forbidding reminder of the ever-increasing onslaught of the plague. And as the bells closer to your neighbourhood began to ring, you could literally hear the plague approaching. It must have been terrifying. As the bells continued to ring out, they triggered panic and the greatest mass exodus London has ever seen. In the next episode, we'll be investigating this flight from London and continue the story as the epidemic exploded. I think people find this whole thing of large numbers of bodies just being tossed in together very, very disturbing. We'll reveal the heroism of nurses and medics. There's a clear understanding that she, she put herself at risk to, to care for patients. We explore the extreme measures taken to stem the contagion. This scares the bejesus out of me. We'll uncover new evidence that explains how the disease spread. Lice would be in this underlayer next to your skin. And trace the plague's relentless advance first across London, then across the country. <laughs>